Thanks, Again, Nancy. thanks to Nancy and Bob. Nancy kind of laid the groundwork for why it is important to think about updated book values. And thanks to Bob, who really showed how there's been progress even in testing manure. And again, why that might be good to update our values as well. So based on this information, we uh, were able to submit and got funded a project where we are creating a US national manure database. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. Overall, we had a couple different uh, activities that we're going to be doing with this project. We plan to design and implement the database and then think about how we can create an access point to the data so that the public can reach it. Overall, our goals are to combine manure analysis data from labs across the US. We realized once we kind of dug into the details of where that data came from in the manure book values through the ASABE or the Midwest Planner Service, that the data sets used for that were pretty small. So I think Nancy showed about 200 samples or so for a lot of those were used and oftentimes from limited regions. But we know we have labs all over the US and this is a set of labs that are part of the manure analysis proficiency program that Bob just talked about in the US that have you know hundreds to thousands of manure samples every year. So why not tap into this existing data and hopefully create a database that's scalable, that we can add or subtract components that might be uh, analyzed in the future. And it'll be hopefully be dynamic going forward so that we don't have these, you know, 20 years later, we're wondering where's the updated data for these databases. Um, this will hopefully keep up as we move forward in time. And then again, once you have a database, you actually have to have a collection point or an access point for people to use it. So we're hoping to provide a couple different ways that people can access the database. And we'll talk about those here in the next few slides. But we plan on providing aggregated information on manure analysis data, spatially, temporally, and hopefully by animal system source as well. Just kind of an example of some of the existing data that we've pulled from some labs is shown in this bottom graphic here. We're able to determine swine systems, liquid manures, poultry solids, beef liquid, beef solid, dairy liquid, dairy solid as examples. And then we have the number of samples below. And then you can see the median and the inner quartile range of the middle 50% of all of the samples uh, within each of these groups. So it really goes to show what the kind of middle values are, what we can expect, but then also the wide range that you might see in manure analyses. So we're hoping to create something that would look like this, but that you'll be able to kind of look for different regions, look at the United States as a whole or whatever it might be. So then as mentioned, we have a couple different activities or those were our main goals, but we have activities to get there. Our first step is evaluating and that's kind of what Nancy talked about today, looking at historical manure data from different labs and looking at temporal and spatial variability in manure samples. Again, we realize that there's going to be different you know, manure storage systems in different regions of the United States. So we're gonna see differences, we expect at least, across the country and what manure looks like from place to place. Our next step is to engage stakeholders. In this case, we wanted to bring in a lot of different viewpoints that of the manure user compute our community. A lot of people that use manure have different ideas, thoughts, um, even just different terminology. So we wanted to try to start standardizing things so that we're all speaking the same language and developing kind of best management practices for talking about manure and then thinking about data collection from that point forward. Third step is actually creating the database to accept manure composition data. Nancy's been working really hard and again, helping us standardize uh, data coming from different labs so that they are all in the same units. Uh, we're using the same terminology throughout, uh, you know, poultry versus turkey, poultry versus chickens, et cetera. Uh, so that way that this database is usable uh, for people who access it. 
And then finally is ensuring the database is FAIR. And this acronym FAIR is for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we plan on doing this through this kind of management system for end users or a way or this access point for people to be able to access the database. It has to be searchable and also interoperable so that people can easily pull the data that they need, especially for um, researchers who might be pulling it for large scale uh, research purposes, like I just completely forgetting the research uh, term that they use, but life cycle analysis, that's what I was looking for, those sorts of things. So here is our project team. The inner circle is the University of Minnesota Extension, as well as CFANS, which is the College Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resources Sciences. We're working with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute to help develop the database. And again, make sure it's findable, um, interoperable, et cetera. And we're working with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture since they are running the Menor Analysis Proficiency Program here in the US. And in fact, it is the only manure analysis proficiency program currently in the United States. So altogether, um, we're hoping to get the background and the backbone of this database put together, but we're also working with this outer ring here that you see our stakeholders. This includes commercial manure laboratories, livestock commodity groups, regulatory agency and staff, researchers, engineers, ag professionals, and even alternative energy groups. Uh, that, that one's been interesting. Um, we did not anticipate that kind of group being interested in the Menard database, but they are as they're thinking about um, using Menard for energy purposes, energy generation. They're interested in knowing what kind of components you can expect in Menard in various regions and how that could play into biogas generation or methane generation, anaerobic digestion, all of those sorts of things. So it's really a wide group and it's really been interesting to work with all of these people. One, just thinking about like standardizing terminology, but also getting everyone's viewpoints about what kind of data they need and how it would fit into their different needs. So progress so far, and Nancy talked a little bit about this. We have a database schema developed. I'll talk about what that means in a few moments. We have compiled some of the use cases or the ways that we think people will be using this data going forward. And then we have developed data use agreements for the incoming data being put into our database since it will be publicly available. Here's an example of our database schema. One of the first things that we realize when we're thinking about database and making it interoperable um, with other things is that everything has to have its place. You might put data into the database, but then everything is gonna tie into something else or a definition of something else. So for instance, you'll have your sample here. It's gonna have potentially a geolocation. It's gonna have manure type, manure source, how the, um, when the sample was collected, so on and so forth. But some of these things have to be defined. For instance, the species will have to be defined and that might include common name, genus, species, so on and so forth. But then each sample will also have a sample ID and a lab associated with it. And with that lab, you're gonna to have to define where that is, name, address, whether they're in the MAP program, are they going through certification process through the manure analysis proficiency program, so on and so forth. So that's kind of what the database schema is. It's how all of this data and metadata interlocks and relates to one another. So that way, um, we can generate this data in a reusable form. Moving on to our use cases, we have a couple different ways that we think people will query or access the data. First is a general public. We imagine that they would want uh, more of a quick shot or quick snapshot of what the data looks like, kind of like that graphic I showed you earlier with mean values of nutrients and ranges that they might expect. So we see this as being aggregated data and there will be some limited filtering cap capabilities. So if you wanna see you know, Minnesota's manure data, you'd be able to select Minnesota. You might be able to select the different species, different components that you wanna look at, so on and so forth. Um, 
we think that, you know, general public will use this as well as planners, nutrient management planners, people who are looking to build barns so that they can get some updated book values, even regulatory agencies, uh, NRCS staff, so on and so forth. We also see a research component coming into play. Those who might want to see, um, look at trends over time, look at trends regionally, so on and so forth. And we expect the access point for this to be similar to something called the NAS Quick Stats. This is a National Agricultural Statistics Service Quick Stats, where you can go in and uh, find out like yield information, acres planted for different counties, different states, so on and so forth. So if you have ever worked with that, we're kind of envisioning um, you'll be able to go in, have a couple different drop downs, and then data for each individual manure sample that comes through the filter would be output into a Excel file or CSV file or something like that. So that way uh, people can look uh, deeper into the data. And then finally, one of our use cases actually came up in our stakeholder meetings with groups and that some of the participating labs who are, will be donating the data or putting the data into the database were really interested in having the ability to benchmark their data with data in the region. So they want to be able to view lab-specific data relative to the aggregated data in the database. So we think this might be more of a login type of situation, so that way they can parse out their data and compare it to the aggregated data. Otherwise, we don't... Um, see you being able to discern participating labs in another way. So these are kind of the three use cases that we currently envision being able to develop over the next couple of years. And our final uh, point that we've done so far is worked on our data use agreements. This is a legal agreement acknowledging that data will be shared with the University of Minnesota uh, so that can go into the database and that it will be publicly shared. Uh, we luckily got it down to just two pages. It's mostly the first page and then the second page is signature pages. So it's pretty good for legalese, we feel. Um, but this will be passed between labs as well as uh, the project team to make sure that everyone is aware, you know, what this database is and what exactly will happen after the data is shared with, with us. So going through this process, we've come across a lot of things we de didn't necessarily expect. Um, sometimes some people might call them challenges. I'm trying to call them opportunities that we've identified. And I have some of those listed here. And Nancy talked a little bit about some of this too. But one of the big things we realized is that terminology and units will need to be translated and or standardized across regions. You know, I'm familiar with upper Midwest. I also spent some time in Maryland. So I'm familiar with the standard units that are used when reporting manure analysis data in those regions. But it turns out in other regions, there might be different, slightly different units used and different reporting requirements based on states. So thinking about how we can translate the data into something that's similar to go into the database is gonna be really important. Another thing we realized is privacy is going to be very uh, important for this thing. We are not asking for any personally identifying information to be shared with us for the manure database. So we've asked all of customer information to be stripped except for a uh, state where the sample was collected and uh, possibly zip code. We do not intend to share full zip codes. We would only share the first three digits of zip codes but we're hoping that helps us a little bit with some of the standardization. But we realize that uh, privacy is gonna be really important. However, some stakeholders would like really, really fine resolution data so that they can look at you know, watershed level, county level data. And we realize that we might not necessarily be able to get kind of that fine of data, but one of the things about this database that's really needed is that we need anything that's more regional, right? We can be able to get at least statewide data, whereas right now we have manure book values that, you know, where did the data actually come from? It's probably only from one region in the United States. And, you know, does that really represent every region? Not necessarily. So this database really ought to help us at least 
get closer to what we might expect in those finer scales. And then finally, one of the interesting things we've learned from the different labs too is that manure sample submission forms are not always filled out properly or barely at all, apparently. So that's been really interesting too. And I'll give you two examples here. Here's a sample submission form from one of the labs we're working with. And you'll see there's a lot of information asked for here, sample information, grower information, agent or advisor, and then quite a bit of information is asked for each of the different samples. There's even like waste code, you have to go to a different page and see what kind of waste it is. That actually refers to you know animal species and storage, that sort of thing. And then we have another lab that we work with that's learned that their customers are just not willing to fill out this information. So they made it as simple as possible. You know, contact information, list of species, and tell us what you want analyzed. So there's definitely a broad range of information being collected. One of our roles and one of the things that we see coming out of this project so far has been the educational needs. You know. What can we do as educators, and many of you on this call might be educators, what can we do to help people understand the importance of filling out these forms? So that's it. Uh, if you're interested in more information, our contact info or my contact information is down here. Our website will be menordb.umn.edu. We have it up and running, but it's only internally available right now. It's not available to the public. We're hoping to have that updated as we, we've we just started getting um, some of the first agreement signed. So we're just starting to get all the data imported into a database and we'll be developing the user access points here soon. If you know of a lab that would be potentially interested in looking at this database, we do have a flyer that we can share with folks if they would like to pass it along to their labs. Or if you are a lab who's watching this presentation, feel free to get in touch if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing with the data and database. And we'll be happy to chat with you.